My name is Christian Ashley, a seminary student and servant of God, and you are listening to the Let Nothing Move You podcast, a proud Anazal Ministries podcast. Welcome back, everyone, to the Let Nothing Move You podcast. I'm your host, Christian Ashley, as we continue on through the book of Exodus, today covering Exodus 28 and 29. Uh, no real announcements except for I'm not alone here. I am back with the man with the worst bedside manner in the state of North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> the man who doesn't care about your feelings but cares about keeping you alive. Karairo of the Foreign Saints podcast. How's it going, Karai? Hey, hey, hey. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You know, I'm like I'm like that recurring nightmare that you can't get free of or that bad itch that you just can't seem to scratch. Man, we are back. We are back again. Representing the foreign oh, yeah. saints, man. Helping you love God, love people, and make disciples in your own life. Good to be back. Excellent. Always good to have you here. Always good to be challenged by what you have to say that I the way you look at things that I would never think of. That's why we do this. Oh, man, I'm happy just, you know, I'm just happy to, uh, you know, just to encourage people to actually look, look deeply into, into the scriptures. You know what I'm saying? Like they're, they're mm-hmm. deeper than you know, and they're better than you think. And I've got, I've got an ax to grind and a bone to pick. And that's what I aim to prove every time. There you go. All right. Well, you say we get into this bad boy. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. I'll be starting today in Exodus 28, verses 1 through 5, reading from the ESV. Then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him, from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with the spirit of skill that they may excuse me, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments that they shall make a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother and his sons to serve me as priests. They shall receive gold, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. Have at it. <laughs> um, you know, you guys probably uh, remember my dulcet tones from our discussion on the slave laws. Um, like I said, I, I picked, uh, I asked Christian if I could jump in on two somewhat dry and controversial sections of Exodus just to show you how much Jesus is buried here. So my belief, I, I would say it's more than a belief. I think it's just truth that I'm going to aim to prove is that the high priest's outfit like, like not just the office of high priest itself, but the actual outfit itself is a picture of Jesus. Um, and as we go through, especially 28 and into 29, I'm going to do my best uh, to establish that. Um, so just some things that I see, um, you know, in Christian, you know, you're going to have everything else, I suppose, um, which is quite a bit. Um, but something that you see in verse 2 is that the garments themselves are holy, right? Mm. Like the outfit itself is holy. And holy is one of those words that, you know, we definitely can get, you know, we forget the definition of, we say it so often that we actually don't know what it means. Um, I I would say holy just means set apart for a purpose unto God. Uh, One of my favorite proof texts for that definition is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4 where he says, everything created by God is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, speaking of food, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Amazing passage, the gospel applied to food. Yes, your Big Mac is holy, probably not healthy, probably not healthy, but but it is holy um, if you receive it with thanksgiving and prayer. Um, and the same thing with these garments, you know, they're set aside for a purpose. Um, and we see that the garments have two big, two big umbrella purposes here for glory and for beauty. As far as the glory, we'll get to that. Um, but beauty, God intended them to look beautiful, to look awesome. He wanted his high priest to look fly and fly. Did they look, um, Mm. they were intended to have a high level of craftsmanship, the highest, I would say. And I would say the chief reason for that is because the high priest is a picture of Jesus. Uh, God empowered people to make this outfit. 
Jesus is beautiful. Therefore, uh, the clothes that represent him um, also ought to be beautiful. Um, and again, for some that don't know, I guess I'll have to I'll have to prove that to Hebrews chapter seven. Uh, Hebrews chapter seven, uh, towards the end, um, you see in verse 23, uh, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he, Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Jesus is our high priest. That's kind of the point of chapter seven and chapter eight of Hebrews and get used to hearing Hebrews a lot. I'll be quoting it a lot. <laughs> As you should. <laughs> what you see there, though, boss? Yeah, uh, to go with like the splendorous display here, like the, the design of the priestly robes aren't meant to be flashy and showy for the sake of just making them look remarkable and rich, just better than the people. But they're meant to be there to display God's glory as he was the one who gave them the ability to have these clothes and the jewels that we'll see later on. This isn't your mega church leader, you know, coming up with diamond rings and gold uh, Rolex watches or and his own private jet kind of scenario. This is no, it's meant to be a beautiful thing. You're meant to look at this and go, something is happening here. That's extraordinary. Mm-hmm. And we even look just at the dyes being used here are immensely expensive especially the Tyrian purple, which, by the way, is something used by one of the tribes they're supposed to wipe out later on. Although we'll see their apostasy will lead them to fail to do so. But that's beside the point right now. <laughs> but like that, they had a, a really a monopoly on it so they could charge whatever they wanted. So they're kind of have to deal with people that God doesn't want them to in order to have something holy. And I think there's something in there as well. It's like, yeah, this world, even this part of the world here that I'm designating for destruction, and eventually won't happen because I know what you're going to do and you're going to fail me. But I'm still there's something useful coming from that part to be used in my holy ceremonies. Mm hmm. That's good. That's good. Um, that's that's actually really good. That'll that kind of theme, I think, it's built on um, in this outfit. Um, you know, verse three tells us that the garments will consecrate him, that the garments are part of consecrating for priesthood. Hang on to that. That'll get developed as well. Um, And, you know, I think so far we see, you know, that Jesus is glorious and beautiful like these robes, but so much more. Um, The color scheme of the robes is very similar, if not identical, to the color scheme of the temple and the tabernacle. Um, So like the color scheme on the so, you know, the tabernacle looked pretty ordinary on the outside, but on the inside. It was decked out with the glory of God. You know, again, picture of Jesus, uh, outwardly humble, inwardly, he's divine. The priestly robes are kind of the opposite. Now you're seeing the temple exude from this person. It's almost like you're watching the tabernacle in the form of a human. Gee, where have I seen that theme before? I'll give you one guess, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, like it's, it's, it's just so interesting to see. I've said this before, but um, like God laid this out in such a way that had Jesus come first and then the law came, it would have been extremely obvious how all this stuff was a picture of Jesus. Like, like the stuff that's in the law, it's almost as if the religious rites came before the one who founded them just to prove that he is the one, unlike in every other religion where the guy comes first and all this stuff develops later. Like it goes in reverse order with with Christianity. And it's so like, you know, God outside of time. Yeah. Now, we also see here at the very beginning, like Aaron's sons are meant to be the first priests of Israel alongside himself. It is from them that the Levitical line continues until sometime after Israel's return from exile that eventually allows for the Pharisees and Sadducees to usurp the positions, which, by the way, in and of itself, because I don't think for sure we know their actual genetic history if they were Levitical in any way. And I have to look that up, their genealogy at some point in time, or maybe it's mm. been just lost to time. But part of the rules of how you're supposed to conduct yourself, as we'll get into later chapter here, are the high priest is supposed to be this holy person, you know, from the specific uh, lineage going alone into the Holy of Holies. And if they're not 
God murders, excuse me, not murders, and God kills them for not doing things correctly. And yet later on, he allows people who I don't think are of that lineage to do it. How merciful is he? I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, even, I mean, as, as we'll soon see, like even the high priest himself has no inherent right to be able to, to be able to go behind the veil anyway. Um, in and of himself, that's what the outfit's for. Um, yeah. You know, so I mean, like, it's just, it's just grace upon grace, um, you know, being, sh- being shown here. And we'll eventually see two of Aaron's sons don't quite make the cut later on in Leviticus. Uh, and that's its own thing. But we also see something I want to bring up is God mentions that these clothes are created by those he himself has gifted with a spirit of skill. I love that phrase. A spirit of skill, meaning that he alone provides their talents and abilities. Mm-hmm. And God has done the exact same for all of us and expects us to use our God-given skills for what are, whatever he has deigned useful for the church and the world. Like, I am not an engineer. I am not someone who wants to work with his hands if it doesn't involve, like, typing or eating. Like, I'm worthless in those regards to build a house or to... Uh, if there's a leaky faucet in the church, I'm not going to be the one who's going to fix it. Someone else has that talent that God has gifted them with. And that's good. Just like the people he specifically brought here, he made them with the capability of making these correctly, of designing these robes correctly in a way that other people just can't do because that's not their purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, literally wholly empowered, uh, you know, fashionistas here, you know, for the kingdom. And that's, Mm. You know, that, that's that's awesome. You know, just again, just like work for God is anything that you're doing for the kingdom, which is a much wider envelope than just, you know, than just preaching, than just teaching, um, than just evangelism, you know, acts of service for the body, acts of love for the body, you know, all, all sorts of things fall fall under that umbrella. And we need to remember that, that, you know. There is no sacred secular divide in truth. There's just a sacred and secular divide that we artificially create in our own minds. And part of the sanctification process is God constantly pushing that uh, that dividing line back and back and back until you come to the realization of the truth, which is everything's sacred. Everything's holy. I got to treat it as such. Um, yeah. You know, again, another another theme that is going to come come up later, actually, in grand detail. Absolutely. Anything else you want to add before we move on? Uh, oh, no, nah, nah, not not for this part. I'm I'm excited. I'm excited. OK, I can feel it. Next <laughs> up will be in verses six to 14. And they shall make the ephod of gold of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and of fine twined uh, uh, to me. Yeah, twined linen, yeah, skillfully worked. It shall have two shoulder pieces attached to its two edges so that it may be joined together. And a skillfully woven band on it shall be made like it and to be of one piece with it, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on the one stone and the names of the remaining six on the other stone, in the order of their birth. As a jeweler engraves signets, so shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in settings of gold filigree. And you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. You shall make settings of gold filigree and two chains of pure gold twisted like cords, and you shall attach the corded chains to the settings. Good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. Um, now something to, something I'm going to note here, I'll, I'll talk about the onyx stones in the next section, actually. Um, but for this section, um, something that I want to note here is, um, how this is where the mixed fabrics prohibition, I think shows its true purpose. Um, you know how people always want to bring stuff up about like, oh, you know, you Christians don't ever don't actually read your Bible. You shouldn't be wearing things and mixed fabrics and all that. Um, no, I I read my Bible, so I actually understand the point of the mixed fabric prohibition. That that law is one piece in a grander picture that 
tells the story of grace and penal substitutionary atonement and the high priest garment is the second part of that picture. Um, Leviticus 1919 clearly says um, that, you know, you shall keep my statutes. It says a couple of different things, but nor shall you wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of materials. Um, And that is reiterated as well in Deuteronomy 22, nine or Sorry, Deuteronomy 22, 11, um, you shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. So in that passage, it's even it's even more specific. Um, but watch how God uses this t- here to show us something. So verse six to me, um, and some would disagree with it, but I think that's more just the rabbinic Judaism anti Jesus. They're kind of talking, but I, I think verse six is clear indicating that there was one part so far, one part of this whole outfit that did have mixed fabrics. The ephod, the vest piece had mixed fabrics. Nothing else in his ensemble so far, there is another piece that will later, has mixed fabrics. But it seems that this piece does. Why? All right. Consider what the ephod holds. The ephod holds, oh, I guess I will mention the two onyx stones, but more in depth in the next section. Um, The two onyx stones with the tribal names engraved into them, right? So Israel's names are etched into the one part of this outfit that has mixed fabrics. Why? I would say it's because the tribes of Israel are not perfect. They are Mm. a sinful people. Hence, this whole sacrificial system with a mixture of righteousness and sin in them. That being said, they are still valuable to God. Therefore, to show that value, their names are engraved on precious onyx and laid on the shoulders of the very priest to show their value and intimacy with God. But their garment is made of mixed fabrics to show their sin and need to be carried by an overall spotless one. I think that's the picture. So like, and even at a bigger level, like the entirety of Israel isn't supposed to wear mixed fabrics, but the high priest is wearing some mixed fabric. So you see a great exchange happening here. The one who's a picture of the sinless one has mixture in himself and the ones that he represents don't. So again, like, no, like I I understand the, the mixed fabrics prohibition, but you know, the people that tend to use this as, you know, a jab just to show their own their own biblical illiteracy on this point. Yeah, well, well argued. I mean, because I'm just looking at that right there and we'll ignore neonic stones for right now. You just see how much care is put into this and it doesn't contradict that later law because that is meant for the people. And this is a specific person that yep. is able to do this. And that's part of the ensemble of the get up is this that is otherwise not supposed to be done. And as well, like just starting off you to the, the gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarns. Well, all four of those colors are considered royal in many different cultures, are considered higher than other people. Most people weren't walking around with those colors because the dyes were more expensive. So for this to happen, that kind of means that either that person is important or what they are doing is important. And it's what Mm -hmm. they're doing that is far more important than the person who is conducting the things they're doing. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's good, man. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, um, I'll actually, I'll build out this argument. This is, this is point one. I have a way to confirm this later on actually, which is pretty cool. Um, like I said, I like, I like this, uh, the slow journey through, you know, And and I hope that, you know, you listener are just kind of having a, whoa, like I, I didn't see all this here. This was just, uh, you know, this was Ohio flyover country for me in my, you know, year read through the Bible plan. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's all better. It's all better than what you think. It's all for him. Look, I, I'll confess I'm that person. These are not my favorite parts of the Bible to read. And discuss because they don't interest me as much. It's not to say there's nothing of value here because we've been talking 20 minutes on, you know, 14 verses and there's still more to come. It's just when 
when I look at scripture, this is not like I'm opening up my Bible today. I'm going to look through Exodus 28 and 29. I'm going to have the time of my life because naturally this is just not something I gravitate towards. But when we, t- we zoom in, we actually see what's going on here. We look in this in light of what they were supposed to be doing versus in light of what Jesus is doing. There's so much more to glean from here. If I just look at this, oh my gosh, they're talking about colors again and clothing. I care nothing about this. <laughs> Like, give me a monochrome shirt that I buy at Walmart. I'll wear it and it'll die and I'll buy another one from Walmart. That's my life. I don't right. I don't think about such things. But God is specifically pointing out these intricacies for the fabric, for the colors of what's supposed to go on here. Because if they're green, it's not what he wants it to be. If they're just blue, it's not a, what he wants it to be. These colors have to merge together because he said to make them this way. Yep. To make a point. Yeah. He's trying to he's trying to paint a picture of of the one to come. You know, I've got a I've got a saying on on our show. I say that we don't read we do not read the Bible to be inspired. We read the Bible because we know that it is inspired. Mm. And I think that applies brilliantly to, you know, passages like this where it's like you're not going to post any of this on your fridge for inspiration. Um <laughs> But, you know, you should recognize that, you know, in Genesis, God skips over vast tracts of time, does not mm-hmm. care to let you know a lick about the Nephilim, as, to be perfectly honest. But this outfit <laughs> gets, a, gets a whole chapter and a half. Why? What, what's, what's the purpose? You know, um, Jesus said, Moses wrote about me. If you understood Moses, you would have believed me. He wrote about me. Well, ask the question, how? Jesus said that the scribes that are fully trained for the kingdom can go into their storehouse and bring out of their treasures, out of their storehouse treasures, both new and old. We're coming into the old and we're bringing out treasures by typology, by asking the question, how does this relate to Jesus? I know it does. Jesus told me it does. So how? Yes. And that's why we, we examine cl- uh, chapters like this, because I could easily just do four to five chapters. And sometimes I will be doing that later on for some of this because I won't have as much to say by myself. But that doesn't mean there's nothing of there's not anything of value in there. It just means that I don't focus as much on those things in light of other things that I'm not as interested in. I'm not going to be expound as much upon, but that's why I'm glad you're here because that's probably what I would have done. I would have, you know, brought in, you know, the Jesus thing. It was like, this is pointing towards him, but I wouldn't have, you know, narrowed the focus as much as you're forcing me to. And I'm very grateful for that. Well, you know, we've all got our, we've all got our strengths and weaknesses, you know, some, sometimes, sometimes this, you know, this, uh, nature of mine can be a little bit of a detriment, but in passages like this, I, I think it helps, you know, so I'm glad I yeah. can, glad I can be helpful to, to people in this. But you got anything else before we move on to 15 through 30? Uh, no, no, no. 15 through 30, uh, you know, the next two or three chunks are where I'm going to, that's, that's where we're cooking meat as we'll say. Excellent. And that's before we actually cook the meat. I know, right? Yeah. You shall make a breastplate of judgment in skilled work. In the style of the ephod, you shall make it of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen shall you make it. You shall be square and doubled, a span its length and a span its breadth. You shall set it in four rows of stone, of stones, a row of sardius, which we really don't know what that is, topaz and carbuncle shall be in the first row, and a second row, an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond, and a third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst, and the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold filigree. There shall be twelve stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They shall be like signets, each engraved with its name for the twelve tribes. You shall make for the breastplate twisted chains like cords of pure gold. And you shall make for the breastpiece two rings of gold and put the two rings on the two edges of the breastpiece. And you shall put to, to, excuse me, the two cords of gold and the two rings at the edges of the breastpiece. The two ends of the two cords you shall attach to the two settings of filigree and so attach it in front to the ring, excuse me, the tings of filigree. And so, oh my gosh, I've got myself all over the place. Let's start over 25. <laughs> Ah, words. Uh, the two ends of the edges of the breast, 
Oh my gosh, I did it again. The two ends of the two cords you shall attach to the two settings of filigree and so attach it in front to the shoulder pieces of the ephod. You shall make two rings of gold and put them at the two ends of the breast piece on its inside edge next to the ephod. And you shall make two rings of gold and attach them in front to the lower part of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod as it seem above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And they shall bind the breast piece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue so that they may lie on the skillfully woven band of the ephod so that the breast piece shall not come loose from the ephod. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel and the breast piece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. And in the breast piece of judgment, you shall put the Urim and the Thummim and they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Then Aaron shall bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart before the Lord regularly. And real quick, Sometimes you got to laugh at yourself. Sometimes you got to be a, I, I, I skipped a word or I, I stumbled over a word. Like there's no perfect preacher out there. Every single person has done that before. So I just got to submit in humbleness. Hey, I can get tongue tied. I'm an idiot. So please, if you laughed, I'm right there with you. You know, man, like I, you know, Ikea instructions do be like that. You know, like sometimes, sometimes you just got to go real slow. You know, go to ruler, make sure you're not jumping lines. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I get it. Um, no, I what, think, what got uh, me, what, what oh, got go me was, and, and what I have here in my Bible is set tings of filigree, but I kept reading rings over and over again. And suddenly there was a tings there and it kept screwing up my mind. What, what the heck is a ting? Did I have to learn another clothing term? <laughs> I got to get a whole, I got to get a whole, uh, a, a fashion degree on, on top of the Hebrew and, and the Greek, you know, like I got, I got a major in uh, Near Eastern ancient Semitic languages and I got to like, get, like minor in, in primary color theory. That's <laughs> like that. That's, that's what it feels like I do sometimes. Um, yeah. Nah, I think uh, I think the that the breast piece of judgment um, confirms uh, confirms my thought process about the onyx stones. Um, so a second piece of the ensemble now that is made with mixed fabric and it also carries the names of the tribes of Israel. I don't think that's coincidental. Again, like I said, the mixed fabric, I would say, displays their need for a high priest of pure fabric to carry them because they aren't good enough on their own. The jewels are valuable here as well. You are in need of a savior, yes, and you have value in the eyes of God, not either or. Um, and since Jesus is our high priest, a la Hebrews, when we got saved, it's like, at least in my mind, this is kind of how my, I guess you might say how my head canon pictures it. It's like a jewel with your name on it was added to Jesus's garment 2000 years ago mm. when he was crucified. He bore your name on the tree when he offered himself. Um, like I said, this, this outfit, man, is, is deep. Um, verses 29 and 30 to me, seem to indicate that the only reason Aaron can bear the names of the tribes is because of the breastplate. If Aaron showed up, let, let's say Aaron shows up without the breastplate and he's just carrying the 12 jewels in his hands or in his pocket or something into the Holy of Holies, then he'd die. You know, like, like yes, he's carrying the people, but he doesn't have the ensemble. Aaron is only able to bear the people because it's really the outfit itself that's doing the carry job. Like, yeah. for, like for how little Aaron actually brings to the table, anyone could have done this since the clothes are doing it all. But God said it was reserved for Aaron and his lineage. It's like, it's like an Iron Man suit of redemption. You know? Like... Like and the and the language of putting on and putting off is a uh, is something that's used quite a lot in the Bible. Um, Paul uses this language Ephesians four twenty to twenty four. Mm -hmm. He says put off and put on. Colossians three twelve. He says um, he says put on. Um, you know, so these so these are things that uh, that we see. Um, and I'm using I'm using the Logos Bible software 
um, for my Bible. And if you Google in Lagos, the phrase put off as a phrase, with quotations around it, um, it'll show you like it'll just bring up every verse where put off is used. And in the Old Testament specifically, um, you know, for the most part. Um, you know, second Kings 25, uh, you know, song of songs five, uh, Isaiah 47, Jeremiah 52, Ezekiel 44. Like I'm just, just seeing passage after passage in the old Testament where put off is used and outside of like two places, um, it's used for clothing, put off your veil. So Jehoiakim put off his prison garments. Um, you know, song of songs five, I had put off my garment. And then you come into the New Testament verses that it pulls, and all of a sudden we're talking about character exclusively. Put off your old self, put on the new, put off the old self with its practices. You know, like, like Jesus is our clothing. So put him on, right? Revelation tells us that by his blood, he has made all of us a kingdom of priests to his God. And priests need an outfit. And for New covenant priests, the outfit is Jesus. Put him on. Put him on. Um, like I said, Jesus cares for his people. He carried right on his chest, over his center and on his shoulders like a lamb, you and I. He loves you so much that he put you on. He put you on and walks right into your punishment for you. He carried you to the cross, wrapped in you, and died like we should have so that you can put him on, be born again, and live the way he does now, today. God is using clothing and fabrics to detail penal substitutionary atonement and how the new birth is supposed to operate. And man, the, uh, you know, the, the, at this point now, the Torah should start to be coming alive for you. Um, I think, uh, I think Aaron knew that the job God gave him could not be performed properly without his outfit. But here's an application question for us. Do we know that? Do we try and serve God without being clothed in Jesus? Warning, you won't be able to bear that on your own. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really important distinction there. It's like they're putting on something. There's an action step there. You have to willfully put on, you know, righteousness. You have to willfully put on the fact that I am a new creation. The fact that, yeah, they're talking specific, specifically about clothing to start. But then the character thing you brought up, I had never thought of it that way before. I had never thought to look of uh, the, the phrase put on and everything there and how it's used for Hey, these are aspects of yourself you have to actively decide to do something about. Mm -hmm. And because this is a very active job that we have, there is no such thing as passive Christianity. Right, right, right. And it's such a good picture of grace, too. You know, like, you know, I think of I think of Tony Stark putting on an Iron Man suit, you know, and it's like, OK, so the act of putting it on is one thing. But then when he actually goes off and fights aliens and stuff. Yeah, I mean, he's wrapped in the suit, but it's the suit that's doing it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like like Tony Stark himself is not generating repulsor rays and all this stuff. Like, that's the suit doing <laughs> that. That's the suit. Yes. You know? Like, like Tony's not running all these calculations in his head. That's, that's Jarvis. You know? So, like, yes. in Grace, we put on the suit, but it, it's, the, it's what we're wrapped in that's actually doing doing all the heavy lifting in our spiritual life. And, you know, the same for us, like, yeah, we got to put them on. And if you want to call that a work and sure, you know, I mean, your Calvinism is showing, but sure. Um, I guess you can call it that. Um, but all of the actual work is being done by the outfit, you know? Yeah. And I think it's super important too, that it specifies it has to be, these things have to be put over his heart and that, that's where your, your mind has got to be set on love, set on thinking about others while you're engaging in these actions. Aaron has to put these things on his, over his heart mm -hmm. because that's his focus is for the people of Israel who cannot do this themselves. So out of love, out of devotion, he is engaging in these sacrifices. He is approaching God himself and the Holy of Holies, uh, something that no one else can do. With the chance that he might die if he screws up, and yet he does it anyways. Yep. At cost, at potential cost to himself, you know, I'm going to 
I'm going to serve you. You know, that's, that's what priesthood is, you know, like, like the very outfit that defines him as a priest has everyone's name on it, but his own, Mm. you know, like it's, it's not about you, Aaron, it's about the flock. And, you know, that's to me is one of my measurements of even a church is like, okay, like how much of this is the church for the pastor's vision or is the pastor for the growth of the flock? Those are, those are, those are two different things. You know, like I'm, I'm not going to church to prop up the vision of the pastor as heretical as that sounds to certain elements of Christianity. The, the pastor is in the <laughs> pulpit to equip the saints for the work of ministry outside the building. It's not about him. And it's not about yeah. us either. It's about Jesus. Absolutely. Well, do you want to get into the onyx stones now or later? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Yeah, we can talk about them. What you, what you got to say about them, boss? I was just meant to say, like earlier, it's brought up and it's brought up he- here again. Every single tribe of Israel is on there. They're, they're ranked in order of who got there first, you know, birth wise, but there's no like sense of this tribe. Reuben is more important than Gad, or Issachar is more important than Judah. It is every single one of them has to be on this stone as a remembrance of why it is necessary for this to be done in the first place, because they are not capable of doing it on their own. Their sins are so great. There has to be this grand ritual service that, by the way, a lot of it, not all of it, but some of it has to keep happening every single day Mm -hmm. because the people keep sinning every single day. Yep. And yet it's just, it's represented by them being over his heart and thinking, these are all the tribes. These are God's people, not one better than the other, but together, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Well, I like the, obviously, because they're etched in stone, there's a sense of permanence to this. And I think most people can catch that. I think the thing that might be missed is the community aspects that using stones kind of kind of subtly speaks to in the sense of I can't pick up just the tribe of Dan on his own. If I'm picking up Dan, I'm picking up five of the tribes with him. Like, yes, like we're, we're, we are in this together. If one of us falls, we all fall. If one of us rises, we all rise. And, you know, Paul definitely talks about that, you know, when he's talking about just body mechanics, spiritually speaking, like if one of us suffers, we all suffer across the globe. We are one body. So, you know, in our local congregations, how do we flesh that out? Don't leave anyone behind. You know, mm-hmm. like, I, I don't know. I got no clue what the actual program was, you know, like the no child left behind. I got no clue what that policy entailed. But I like the name of it when I was a kid. The no child left behind thing that <laughs> I saw on the PBS. I, I always loved the name of that because I was like, man, I wish we actually like did that. Like, I know that that's a value that we all aspire to, but we don't actually do that. Like, like we as humans, we pick and choose who we want, um, who, who we want to keep with us and who we want to leave behind. Um, but spiritually speaking, man, like if they're in Christ, don't leave them behind. Don't leave them behind. You know, if he's struggling, help him. You know, if he needs some ministry help, help him. Like if, if he's got, you know, bills to pay and things to run, give him a hand. You know, we're all etched into the same stone. And we're all being carried together. So help each other. Yeah, I think that's, that's beautifully said. I mean, it, you mentioned Dan earlier and you weren't thinking about this, I don't think. But it, if Israel as a whole had acted like, hey, we're not going to leave Dan behind because Dan, out of all the other tribes of Israel, is probably the most uh, apostate. Uh, t- oh, yeah. Yeah, I really wasn't thinking of that. I just, just threw Dan out there. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And. and like if they had just banded together and said, hey, get your act together. We're in this together. Well, that would require them to be doing what they were supposed to be doing, too, which is a huge ask for Israel's right. history. But but if they had done what they were supposed to do, one tribe goes astray. OK, well, let's join together, get them back on track. Well, right. The church needs to do that, too. It's like, hey, no, we had a leader engage in sin. Well, let's strip them of their position, but let's not abandon them. Let's make sure. They know there is forgiveness, but there are also consequences for what they've done. Well, you know, so let's like work said, alongside them. Like you said, it's it's tough to have that mindset when you're playing the hypocrite yourself. 
Yeah. You know, because to help someone else out is to bring conviction on yourself. Um, you know, so hypocrisy, hypocrisy definitely does lead to fracturing of of bodies um, because it requires, you know, like like hypocrisy is a, is a deviation from a standard and togetherness requires coming back to it, which I don't want to do. So I'm going to go my <laughs> way. I'm going to let you fall apart your way and, and we'll all fall apart together. Um, it's a, it's definitely a dysfunctional unity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's one of those things too. It's like, you know, later on we see in judges, like the entire tribe of Benjamin is instead of like, Hey, these people committed sin on your land and get, bring them to us. Let's have justice done. They decide, Nope, it's time for civil war. And if I yeah. remember correctly, aren't the Urim and Thummim, don't they show up in that story too? Or or at least implied in like God asking, or people asking God for answers on what they should do? I mean, they they might. I don't know. The, I don't know that story too well off the top of my head. Um, so I, I couldn't speak thing? to it. It's the same thing as Israel. It's not doing its job either because they keep losing against one tribe. You know, they, should, <laughs> they have the superior numbers. And yet, even though they seem to be consulting God, it doesn't seem like their hearts are behind it because they're allowing sin in their own lives as well. Uh, remembering that this was started by a Levite. Uh, yeah, a traveling Levite, if I remember the story correctly, and his uh, concubine being murdered. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of Judges. Yeah, that that comes back to me now. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a dark episode. Oh, indeed. It, but Levites, by the way, being the people who are supposed to keep the people in line, mm-hmm. they're supposed to know the law, and yet, as a result of that, this triggers. So, yeah, it, you can't just if you're not doing your job, if you're not being there for the people, in whatever administrative role you have, or no matter how small your, your role is in the church, you're not doing it effectively enough. You're not calling out sin. You're not being humble and saying, hey, I screwed up. You're not confessing what you've done. Well, then other people can just do whatever they want yeah. because you're not doing your job. So why should they have to care? Yeah. You know, like, you know, hip- hypocrisy leads to uh, hypocrisy leads to, to church scandals and, and church hurt because no one wants to call anyone out. And yeah. the name of faux tolerance, um, hmm. you know, but such are the such are the times that we live in. You know, we want to claim that we hate hypocrites in the church and then get mad at God when he gives us ways to prevent that sort of thing from happening. Hilarious. Utterly hilarious. Oh, um, no, so, so great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Urim and Thummim, you know, in- interesting little things. Um, not the, the only thing I really care about saying is that these these are not the same as divination because yes. God himself gave them. And if you think that God giving someone the right to do something is a poor excuse, you have a low view of the authority of God. And that's the thing you need to actually deal with. Yeah, they just they just kind of show up on the scene. There, there, there's no preamble. There's no dis- description of how they were beautifully made uh, in the same way that the breast piece was, uh, they're just, they just kind of show up and they're, Hey, there are things now. And later on, we're going to see them be used, you know, to consult God for aid. Uh, like they would cast them down and whenever it worked, they would get answers directly from God. Exactly. How is lost to time? Like scholars have debated for years on what they are and how they work. But I mean, the simple fact of the matter is we don't know for sure. So as much as I hate saying that out loud, we can only speculate and speculate I shall. I mean, with how much we already idolize everything else in Jewish culture, you know, the Urim and Thummim would just be another holy grail magnet for people's idolatry. Um, <laughs> you know, if if we did still have them today, I mean, you're talking about you're talking about two stones or jewels or something that, quote unquote, have God's approval for divination like purposes yeah nah the pe- that that's becoming an idol if people ever dig that yeah you know um yeah and and because it's jewish it'll it'll sneak under the radar of everybody cuz i guess idolatry of jewish things is okay because it's jewish um yeah yeah can you can, can yeah. you tell the conversation with that guy is still on my mind <laughs> hey you're a brave man for continuing that one you know, he, he doesn't like, sound, yeah, I, I won't say anything else. You know, like, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'll send him this episode though. I hope he likes this episode. You know, like like I, I definitely Good. do pay attention to the Hebrew scriptures. I just you know, oh man, no, you know that's not even that's not even for most of y'all. It's just for one guy. If he hears it, he'll know who he'll, he'll know it's for him. Oh um, yes, uh, <laughs> another conversation we had off screen about ministry opportunities in life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, fun stuff. Oh, fun stuff. Yeah. So. In regards to Urim and Thummim, I'm just going to speculate that plenty of other scholars have suggested it. Maybe they were just things that were already in existence in Jewish tradition, and they were just never brought up before now. Uh, that maybe you know, God gave them to Abraham at one point, or Isaac, or Jacob, or someone else, and now they're a thing. Or, or they've always been a thing. Um, other, and they would use this, this as an approved divining means to know the will of God. This isn't like, I'm going to throw these bones into a pot and see what shape forms from it or uh, getting my tea leaves out or watching the stars. And of course, the, now that Mercury's in retrograde or whatever, that means God is angry or I don't know, astrology. Uh, <laughs> better things to do with my time. Yeah. yeah. Others think that they were created here without a verse being provided to actualize this belief. I mean, there's really no wrong answer as far as speculation goes. Yeah. Um, s some believe that they were covered with every single letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And if you threw them on the ground, they could spell out God's commands when thrown multiple times over. Others believe that, you know, since the words literally mean light and perfections, they represented and maybe even glowed with like a, a whiter light for a positive things and a darker light for more negative things to show God's disposition on matters. And that may also tie into another speculation. That they just worked as like a yes or no system. Like, and if they landed one way, that meant yes. Another way it meant no. Uh, regardless, they were immensely important for the Jewish people. And we'll see them later on in scripture serving their purpose of bringing God's desires to those who would listen to his words. Mm hmm. And, you know, and it's only an approved method for the high priest anyway. You know, no, no one else could do this. Only the high priest was actually carrying these things on his yep. person. Um, and again, in that way, also picture of Jesus. You know what I mean? Like the light and perfection of God is literally in this person with this person. He's got a, you know, a, a special leading from God um, in a way that like the rest of us don't. Definitely Jesus. Um, you know, so again, it's just, again, just like every piece right down the list is just, yo, that, that reminds me of Jesus too. Just, man, <laughs> it's a fun game. It's a fun game typology. Are we ready to move on? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, verses 31 through 39. You shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue. It shall have an opening for the head in the middle of it with a woven binding around it, the, uh, around the opening, like the opening in a garment so that it may not tear. On its hem, you shall make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and around, around its hem with bells of gold between them a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the grove. And it shall be on Aaron when he ministers and its sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord. And when he comes out so that he does not die, he shall, you, excuse me, you shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engravings of a signet holy to the Lord. And you shall fasten it on the turban by a cord of blue. It shall be on the front of the turban. It shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall regularly be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, man, in interesting stuff here. The, the only part of this whole study that was actually difficult <laughs> To me, I think was the bells, um, the bells with the pomegranates. I think to me, it, it's reinforcing the idea that the outfit is bearing the guilt instead of the man inside them. Um, I know that uh, in this, you know, we, we we might if there's anything we're going to disagree on, it might be about the bells, um, just because I kind of. I kind of diverge from the crowd, you know, big surprise. I diverge from the crowd, but you know, I, I diverge from the crowd and I, I'm not convinced. I'm not a hundred percent convinced that the ringing of the bells was to alert God because God sees everything at all times and he doesn't need an alarm system. So, you know, when it says that, um, 
when it says so that he does not die, um, you know, I'm not sure if that's because of the noise the bells make or because of the outfit itself, you know, like, um, you know, cause he's, uh, it sounds shall be heard when he goes into the holy place, you know? Um, and so in that mm-hmm. way, I think the bells would also serve as an, you know, another just audio reminder to Aaron, you know, as he's walking in this, he's walking in grace the whole time. Like this outfit's covering me, you know, like, like if these bells aren't ringing, then, you know, my, my, you know, that means I'm not wearing this outfit, you know, yeah. like it's not so much an yeah. alert to God. It's more just like, nah, like if the bells aren't ringing, you're not wearing your outfit, put it on. <laughs> you could die doing this. Um, you know, you, you, and you don't want that. You don't want that to happen. Um, the, the crown and, and the guilt of the holy things. This is interesting. This, 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 this is, this is sleeper cell levels of theology. Um, the crown makes me think of the mark of the righteous in revelation. That's a complete sidebar, not opening that can of worms today, but it, you know, it's just something I think of more pertinently though. Aaron is literally crowned with holiness. <laughs> um, because he is a picture of the one who truly is crowned with holiness to God, Jesus, the son. And the way that this is worded makes it seem like this crown of holiness um, is what allows Aaron to bear the guilt from the holy things that the people give as gifts. Like that's, that's specifically what this crown is for. It seems, um, because verse 38, Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall regularly be on his forehead <clears throat> that they may be accepted before the Lord. So there's a connection between Aaron wearing this crown <clears throat> of holiness and the gift offerings of the people um, being able to be accepted. So I'm going to do my best to explain this. <clears throat> um if I need to clarify anything as I go, Christian, speak for the people. Um, uh, oh, real, real quick, I realized I didn't do verse 39 like I said I would. Okay. Uh, uh, you shall weave the coat and checker work of fine linen, and you shall make a turban of fine linen, and you shall make a sash embroidered with needlework. Take it away, Karai. All right. Um, yeah, be definitely be the voice of potentially much needed clarification. Um, Indeed. So about this. Uh, concept of bearing the guilt of the holy things. The holy things in this passage are the things given as gifts by the people. It definitely seems to me that that that's the immediate holy things. Um, And why are those gifts holy? Because they're being set apart by the people for a purpose unto God. Remember our definition from earlier, 1 Timothy. Um, So why do these things have a guilt attached to them? You wouldn't think that offerings to a temple of God would have guilt associated with them, but apparently these do. Why is that the case? Um, Hebrews chapter 9. I told you I'd quote it a lot. Um, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 18 to 23. I'm just going to read this. (sighs) Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood, both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. There's that connection. Forgiveness of sins about objects? What's that about? Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Catch that. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. Um, 
the point the author is making is this. Um, the earthly temple and associated gear is a copy of what exists in heaven. Um, by the time you guys are hearing this episode, I think you would have gone through Exodus 25 by this mm -hmm. point. Um, verses 8 and 9 tell us that Moses was given a pattern that God gave Moses a pattern to build the temple and all these things after. Um, so in heaven, there's the original and these things on earth are the, are the copy. So that's point one. Point two, the heavenly temple is greater than the earthly temple. Seems pretty obvious to me. Point three, the earthly temple needed to be cleansed by blood and the blood of animals was used. Conclusion, the heavenly temple also needs blood to purify it. Because the earthly temple is the copy of the heavenly. So what happens on earth kind of sort of happens in heaven. But it'll need better blood than animal blood, a.k.a. Yes. the Messiah's. The Messiah's blood purifies the heavenly temple. The animal sacrifices are a picture of that concept. Now, why is any of that necessary? Um, notice that they needed to be purified. Of what, though? They're objects. I would say guilt, because that's what is talked about in Exodus. Um, so every single object in the temple, even the high priest outfit, as we'll see later on, um, mm -hmm. was fashioned with material that came out of a cursed earth. Catch that. All this material... The, the wood and then the paint and the dyes and the fabrics, all of it is coming from a cursed earth. All right. And then you add on top of that any guilt that was etched into the land by unrepentant sin on Israel's part. Right. Mm -hmm. Murders that aren't dealt with etched into the land, untaken Sabbaths etched into the land, all that. So that's why it all had to be purified with blood. There's a curse to be dealt with and a reminder that the earth itself needs rescue from bondage, not just humanity. So Aaron can bear that because he is a picture of the only one who truly can, but only after he has that outfit on properly and after the outfit itself has been purified by blood. So this crown of holiness that Aaron wears to me, um, again, Jesus has his crown, but during his uh, crucifixion, he had a different crown. He had a crown of thorns, oh. right? So he exchanged his crown of holiness for a crown of thorns. And if you recall in Genesis, what was the symbol of the cursed earth? Thorns. So that crown of thorns on Jesus's head replaces the crown of holiness during his sufferings to show that he was not just bearing the guilt of humanity, but also bearing the guilt of all the holy things, a.k.a. the world itself. And I think that that's what, you know, this this crown of holy to the Lord on Aaron is, is uh, depictive of um, Jesus, not just bearing the sin of people, but also bearing the curse um, in such a way that it actually cleanses the entire creation to be able to be reconciled back with its creator. Where do I start with that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very, very well said because I'm right there with you. This whole thing, like it, it's such an odd detail until you think about it. What the guilt of the holy things, how, how can holy things have guilt? But, where did those holy things come from? From a fallen, corrupted earth. So even though they're being used for holy purposes, they still are left with the taint of the fall. Something that needs to be reconciled to God before you can even start getting close to him. So that's what the blood is meant to cover. And we'll see in 29 how they themselves have to cover parts of their body. Uh, not the whole body, but parts of their body in blood, just even approach, just even, not even started the ritual yet. Just have to get there mm -hmm. covered by blood. And because that's the only thing, so the life of something else is the only thing that can bring them to a holy and perfect God. Yep. Who cannot abide the presence of sin, who cannot abide the, abide the presence of the fall, 
without something substituting for them. Yep. And, and the holy temple in heaven being Jesus's blood is the only way for us to have that. Go ahead. Yep. Um, those of y'all that are quick with these things might say to yourself, well, that, well, that all sounds good, but but the animals who are being sacrificed are also coming from a cursed earth, right? Yes. Which is why the author of Hebrews will say that the blood of bulls and goats never took away sin. <laughs> because they're part it's of that covered. same cursed structure, right? They're a picture of the one who did. The only reason any of this stuff has any meaning whatsoever is because these things, these rituals, these rites, this outfit, all of this stuff is just the shadow that Jesus, the son of God, is casting backwards through time from his death in 33 AD. That's the only reason any of this stuff matters, right? All of this stuff, engaging in this system, simply your way of saying, God, I want my sin to be credited to the account of the Son of God so that when he eventually comes and pays it, I'm good, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's what all this is. You engage with this system by faith as well. You know, it's I have like, faith that the blood of these lesser creatures will pay for the greater. I don't know how that works, but that's what he said. Yeah. I mean, it's like I, I was probably seeing what those flex tape commercials or whatever with like, hey, there's a hole in the boat or there's a hole in this uh, jar holding back water. It's like, yeah, you can put the flex tape on there, but there's still a hole. There, there's still <laughs> a, in the system like you've temporarily solve the issue but you haven't solved the issue which is that there's a crack which is that there is impurity mm -hmm. and yeah this earthly thing can temporarily cover that up but it cannot cover it up completely from a holy and perfect god when it is your time to stand before him yep yep because now you've you've ascended to the higher temple bro so yeah you're gonna need something better you are gonna need something better um yeah, yeah. There's, there's so much i could say about that right like i, I could really mess with people's minds you know any time that you listeners have a chance, go read Isaiah 6 and ask yourself, the angel pulled a hot coal from the altar, but Isaiah 6 never tells us what sacrifice was on that altar that was dripping onto those coals. Interesting. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I won't even answer that. I'll just toss that out as a riddle. You guys can have fun with that one. Hint. Hey, it's your Jesus. For day. <laughs> you know? Like... <laughs> I expect your 20 page paper in the morning. Right. Right. Oh man. This, this, this is fun. This is what I, I told you. He was going to be cooking once we got to this part. I, see, there's always that part of me. is like, how could we possibly talk for over an hour on these two chapters? And we haven't even gotten to the second one yet. Yep. Yep. I know. I know. Oh my gosh. And, and yeah, something else you said earlier, like uh, I might disagree with you. In fact, I don't, uh, on the the bells, I think they were just another part of the ritual, another part of the ensemble where if you do not do these things as I have said, you're not going to make it out of there alive. And because I have said to do these things, that makes them holy because, oh, by the way, I'm God. Remember that part. So mm -hmm. if I tell you, put on these little pomegranate bells with the you know your purple and scarlet and blue yarns and all that. Do what I say, because if you don't, you're going to end up dead on the floor. And that's why they would tie a rope around, yep. around the high priest, because the bell stopped ringing. That was a very bad sign. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't enter the Holy of Holies because then there'd be a second corpse in the room. Right. right and then a third right. until eventually, maybe if they're all holding on to each other, you might be able to pull them out. <laughs> Oh, man. You know, I mean, that's that's what you got to do, you know, um, but that, but that's the thing, you know, it's like it's like if he's wearing the outfit and the bell should always be ringing. Right. So, like, mm -hmm. if the bells are ringing and then they stop, you know, it's like it's like, why? Why would you take that outfit off? That outfit was your protection, bro. Yeah. You know, like, you know, it's like, why, why would why would you take off Jesus? That's the whole point of the book of Hebrews. Why would you take off Jesus? He's your protection, bro. He's your refuge, mm -hmm. man. What are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. Anything else before we finish off this one chapter? With oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we can, yeah we, we can finish it off. We can finish it off. We got some cooking for okay. chapter 29. Yeah, we do. 
<laughs> Here's for the next hour. For Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. You shall make them for glory and beauty, and you shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him, and you shall anoint them and ordain them and consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. You shall make for them linen undergarments to cover their naked flesh. They shall reach from the hips to the thighs, and they shall be on Aaron and on his th- sons when they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, lest they bear guilt and die. They shall be a statute forever for him and for his offspring after him. Hmm. I think, um, oops, sorry. Uh, whoa, don't glitch on me now. Um, verse 40, I think, reiterates the beauty and glory again. I did not forget the glory part, just not there yet. Um, verse 41 <laughs> shows uh, that Aaron and the rest had the garment placed on them. They did not put it on themselves. Another picture of grace. God needs to be the one to clothe us in his son, just like he clothed Adam and Eve in the garden clothing. Very important theme carried throughout scripture as we're seeing today. Um, Verse 43 continues to press the idea that the clothes are doing the bearing of guilt, not the man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And as, as opposed to the robes of the high priest, like the robes of the priest beneath him were meant to showcase humility by not being as flashy or grand as his robes were. And this was supposed to be something done to keep them in line, make them humble. They were also supposed to wear undergarments to prevent unintended flashing to those watching them as they ascended to do their work at the altar and kept them from having disruptions during their holy ceremonies. As As part of the fall, we wear clothing to keep those hidden only to be seen by someone else, your Mm -hmm. wife. So to prevent that from happening, given how they typically dressed, this was specifically designed for them to not cause a ruckus. Yep. Yep. That's good. That's good. See, see, I didn't have that written down. That's, that's a, that's a Christian Ashley original right there. That's like the five different commentaries original, uh, (laughs) who I should, I should probably source these things, but oh, well, this future Christian problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, screw that. Right, right. Oh, man. That's funny. (laughs) Anything else before you hop into 29? Oh, nah, man. We we ready for 29. We ready for 29. We'll be in verses 1 through 14. Now, this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. Take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. You shall make them of fine wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket and bring the bull and the two rams. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then... You shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and the gird with, excuse me, and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. You shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put coats on them and you shall gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and bind caps on them. And the priesthood shall be theirs by a statute forever. Thus you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting. Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall take part of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and the rest of the blood you shall pour out at the base of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them and burn them on the altar. But the flesh of the bull and its skin and its dung, you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. Yep, 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 yep. Um, I got a little bit for this, uh, for this section. Um, most, of, most of what I've got, again, is towards the end here to kind of bring it all together. But these first 14 verses do show us some typologically important things. They did not consecrate themselves either. They had to be Uh consecrated by another to be able to serve as a priest. And Jesus consecrates each of us by his sacrifice and spirit for service. Um, And they needed an unblemished sacrifice along with unleavened bread, which is like, come on, bro. So Jesus, it hurts. Um, Blood sacrifice (laughs) for sin. Um, And and catch this, too. Even down to how they handled the bull. 
I think, is a picture of Jesus. The blood of the bull is taken to the altar, but the flesh of the bull was destroyed outside the camp, just like Jesus. His flesh was destroyed mm. outside the city on the cross, and his blood is what was taken up um, as the offering. It's like like every little detail, man, it pictures him. Um, the unleavened it's bread, like land I think. Or something. I know, right? <laughs> it's, it's like he thought about it for more than five minutes. Um, the unleavened bread, I think, is a picture of Jesus as well. Bread without leaven, um, bread without sin, leaven and yeast being used by Jesus all the time in the New Testament as as a you know as a, as a picture of sin. Um, telling his telling his boys avoid the leaven of the Pharisees, avoid the leaven of Herod, um, and here with the priests. They have bread without its leaven. Um, so again, it's just like, you know, everything about this setting you up so that when Jesus comes, you're like, it's him. And it's easy to believe in him instead of hard. Yeah. And this whole thing, this this beginning ritual was done to consecrate God's chosen priests for the good work of watching over and remitting the sins of well, covering the sins of the people by performing these sacrifices, but they themselves were not good enough to do it without following God's instructions to make themselves pure. Now we're going to see how some of these actual sacrifices for the people are going to be followed up on in the start of Leviticus. But for now, the priests are just being consecrated to prepare for the actual uh, rituals and sacrifices they're going to have to perform when God gives those in Leviticus. Mm -hmm. And this was also done in the sight of God's people who are going to watch their priests humbly submit themselves to God's work. And the water is there to cleanse them alongside the anointing oil. And I think the last thing I have on that is then after all that is done, they sacrifice a bull unblemished because something needed to die and shed its blood for their sins so that yep. they could be as pure as possible before a holy and perfect God. They didn't bring the bull that was the runt of the litter. They didn't bring the one that had broken a leg. They needed something as perfect as possible for a fallen creation to showcase, to be there in their stead. Mm -hmm. be because if God were always perfectly just in how he handled everything, they wouldn't have been there in the first place. They'd all be dead the right. moment they committed their first sin. But right. here's a way out. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's showcase, showcasing, uh, showcasing mercy to come, you know? So man, just, just awesome. Just awesome. But yeah. We can, uh, we can, we can keep it pushing. Like I said, I got, uh, okay. this is all, it's all going to tie together. Okay. 15 to 28. Then you shall, take, you shall take one of the rams, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. And you shall kill the ram, and shall take its blood, and throw it against the sides of the altar. Then you shall cut the ram into pieces, and wash its entrails and its legs, and put them with its pieces and its head, and burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. You shall take the other ram... That, and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram and take part of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tip of, uh, tips of the right ears of his sons and on the thumbs of their right hands and on the great toes of their right feet and throw the rest of the blood against the sides of the altar. Then you shall take of the part of the blood that is on the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and his son's garments with him. He and his garments shall be holy and his sons and his son's garments garments with him. You shall also take the fat from the ram and the fat tail and the fat that covers the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them and on and the right thigh, for it is a ram of ordination, and one loaf of bread and one cake of bread made with oil and one wafer out of the basket of unleavened bread that is before the Lord. You shall put all these on the palms of Aaron and on the palms of his sons and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. Then you shall take them from their hands and burn them on the altar on top of the burnt offering as a pleasing aroma before the Lord. It is a food offering to the Lord. 
You shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's ordination and wave it for a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your portion. And you shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering that is waved and the thigh of the priest's portion that is contributed from the ram of ordination from what was Aaron's and his son's. It shall be for Aaron and his sons as a perpetual due from the people of Israel, for it is a contribution. It shall be a contribution from the people of Israel from their peace offerings and their uh, their contribution to the Lord. Yep. Um, you know, verses 15, 19, and 20, 21, you know, shows the purification by blood of the priests and the holy things. Um, again, even the outfit itself, like I said earlier, like the writer of Hebrews said, it all had to be purified by blood. Um, and you also see, um, I didn't write it in my notes, um, but it is one of those verses that I definitely keep pretty dear to me. Um, verse 19, talking about the smearing of the blood on the right ear and the and the thumbs and the toes. Um, you know, I always think of this when I hear the phrase, you know, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Um, cause, cause that's really what this is. Like, like they're, he's applying blood to the right ear saying that ear is mine purchased. You should like this ear should be used to hear me. This hand should be used to serve me. This feet, these feet should be used to go where I need you to go when I want you to go there. Um, and again, all, all this stuff is right at the beginning, right? So they're smeared with blood first and then they serve they don't serve for the right to have the blood applied the blood is always first the blood is always primary um in the torah you know even with the passover you know the blood is applied to the door frame and then they're spared from death and then they're they're freed and all that stuff so so the blood is always first um and then the mercy of god on you know fire via the blood yeah and i think it's important the right designation there's plenty of interpretations people bring i i think what might be the one specifically is that most people are right hand dominant mm -hmm. in that extent unless they're from benjamin and we'll get to that later on in judges but for right now it's the idea that your dominant side most of you are going to be able to go through this that is what is being used what you would typically go your hand would stretch out first which hand are you going to use probably your right what are you going to lean in to hear what someone has to say probably your right ear what are you going to move forward with first probably your right foot these things that you use with your everyday actions are being brought in here for this specific purpose to make you recognize that hey i just asked you to cover these right things imagine if i asked you to do the left as well and then your whole body mm -hmm. be grateful it's just this because I could ask more of you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like that's, that, that's the, uh, you know, that's the, that's the symbolism there. It's like, if I, if I have the ear of a man, if I have the hand of a man, and if I have the feet of a man, I just have the man, you yeah. know? And that's, you know, that's what, um, that's God's aim. You know, he's, he's trying to have us. Um, and so that's, that's the picture there. And again, you know, everyone under Jesus we become priests. So spiritually, this is true of us, you know, to Jesus, my ear, my hands, my feet, I'm yours. Um, you know, that, that's the, at least to me, I would say that's, that's the clear, the clear picture here. Yeah. And we also see like the first ram is killed for the sake of the one sacrifice. And we're going to get more clarification on that yeah. in uh, Leviticus 1. Yeah. So you have to start with the person who's doing this because, oh, by the way, they're not holy and pure. <laughs> so what needs to be done to make the rest of the stuff work? Make sure their sins are covered first. Mm -hmm. So and by burning the whole ram, they're acknowledging that they have failed God with every fiber of their own being. There was nothing. There was no part of them that was good enough to be with God. Mm hmm. Like this whole, this, this whole system is a mercy and in some ways a burden. I'll talk about the burden later, but, um, at, at its core, it's a mercy, you know, like they couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't interact with God, um, mm -hmm. you know, without, without this, uh, being here, which is why Jesus 
is so great Um, because without him, you have this. Not to say that this is bad because this is good. It's bringing you into relation with God. But what we have in Messiah, um, so much better, (laughs) so Mm -hmm. much better um, than, than this. Uh, you know, cause I, I, I read this and I'm just like, oh my good, like I'll, I'll get to it later. You know, you'll hear my full joke on this later, but man, do I have enough time in the day for this, bro? Like, like, but this, is why you I, needed, I, this, this is why you needed to like, to like separate out a whole one twelfth of Israel's population just to do this, just to do this <laughs> for them and everybody else. Cause that's a lot of work. And it's crazy too. Can you imagine? You know, being a preacher, a pastor, whatever, it's hard enough as it is. But on top of everything else you had to do, you had to do this every single day. You had to sacrifice for yourself. You had to sacrifice for the people. You had to deal with blood every day. I am a prissy little princess. I don't like getting dirty. God forbid I touch someone else's blood or another being's blood, even for a holy purpose like this. Oh, I've just disqualified myself from the role. Like, oh, yeah. I don't have to do I, that anymore. Praise yeah. God. I I stick my hands in dead and dying people every day, every other day. So, you know, <laughs> I've kind of, you know, healthcare has definitely, I guess, lessened the squeamishness of the blood. But, man, do I still feel the work, just the sheer work of this you know and some of these things some of these things only happen at the ordination of the priest but some of the stuff that comes later is legitimately every day and i'm like but just just your job in general touching dead people you had to do special things after that to be considered clean oh yeah can you imagine having to do that every day yeah, yeah, every day. Yeah, yeah, not nah, like hand hand washing is wild. Like you think you're doing <laughs> a lot. Nothing you lose patients to, every day. <laughs> right. Like you, you think that you're doing a lot just to uh you know, just just to you know, like scrub in for a surgery suite or you know, put on the bunny suits. You know, like you think that's doing a lot. This this is a lot. <laughs> yeah. This is a lot. Man, the the burden of sin is heavy. Absolutely yeah. heavy. Then we get to the second ram. Now, this was killed for the sake of the others performing their roles and sacrificing for the sake of the people of Israel. Its blood needed to be shed to put on the priests to show the cost of their sins. But this one wasn't wholly sacrificed like the first one. This would be utilized for the sake of the priests to provide them with a meal for their services. Hey, you have earned by doing this, the right to have some of the good here. Like, you are paid for your for what you've done. Priests need to eat. Mm-hmm. And what better way than using the sacrifices already provided for them so they don't put it to waste. So this is God putting it in the system itself. You are paid for what you're doing, and I'm going to provide you for what you are doing. So at least you don't have to cook the food later because you already kind of did it. Yep. Yep. Let the uh let the one that preaches the gospel live by the gospel. Yeah. Seeing that seeing that principle right there, right there already. Yeah. Anything else for this side? Um no. No, not for this side. I'll probably roll it in with some of the some of the stuff later. Okay. Well we'll go to twenty nine through thirty seven. The holy garments of Aaron shall be for his sons after him. They shall be anointed in them and ordained in them. The son who succeeds him as priest, who comes into the tent of meeting to minister in the holy place, shall wear them seven days. You shall take the ram of ordination and boil its flesh in a holy place. And Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket in the entrance of the tent of meeting. They shall eat those things with which atonement was made at their ordination and consecration. But an outsider shall not eat of them because they are holy. And if any of the flesh for the ordination or the bread remain until the morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. Thus you shall do to Aaron and to his sons, according to all that I have commanded you. Through seven days you shall you ordain them, and every day you shall offer a bull as a sin offering for atonement. Also you shall purify the altar when you make atonement for it, and shall anoint it to consecrate it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and consecrate it, and the altar shall be most 
holy. Whoever touches the altar shall become holy. Yeah, wild, isn't it? Wild, isn't it? Hmm. Um, in that way, Jesus is also kind of like the altar, you know? Oh, don't touch that. Uh, don't touch that leper. You'll be made unclean. No, sir. No, sir. I'm the altar. I make things mm. holy and I don't lose my own. I bring you up. You don't pull me down. Um, <laughs> verse 29 again shows how necessary this outfit is for any kind of service at all. Each descendant of Aaron had to be clothed in this robe himself and properly sealed by the blood. It was not enough to say that his daddy did it. He mm -hmm. himself had to be wrapped in this, um, you know, and this is like the ultimate preacher's kid lineage, the, the, the line of Aaron, you know, like if anyone's going to say, oh, I don't have to do all this. I'm just kind of grandfathered in. No, you weren't. Every person had to have this done for themselves. They could not rely on the religiosity of an ancestor. Um, again, like John the Baptist said it so clearly. Don't think that just because your son's of Abraham, you're fine. That's, that's not it. Um, that's not it at mm -hmm. all. Um, verse 33 is huge, is huge. One of the one of the things I told myself, don't miss this. You know, if anything else gets missed, don't don't miss this. Um, they're commanded to eat those things with which atonement was made. And an outsider shall not eat them because of their holiness. Jesus fulfills this, too, when he instates communion. We also have to eat the thing that made our atonement. We eat the bread representative of his body broken for us and drank the wine representative of the blood offered for us. Also, non-Christians cannot take communion because it's holy. You'd be eating mm -hmm. and drinking judgment on yourself because you aren't clothed in him when you partake. You're not enough to bear your yeah. own guilt. You need another. Um, <clears throat> there is something fun in this little passage, though, about this passage, right? Because there is an exception. There is an exception. And the exception to this rule is another layer of revealing the gospel. Every layer you go, like Inception, there's just more gospel. At every layer that you go down. Um, <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 22, verse 10, uh, 10 to 16 says this. A lay person shall not eat of a holy thing. No foreign guest of the priest or hired worker shall eat of a holy thing. But if a priest buys a slave as his property for money, and if you're offended by that, we already did the episode on that. Get current. Um, the slave may eat of it, and anyone born in his house may eat of his food. If a priest's daughter marries a layman, she shall not eat of the contribution of the holy things, but if a priest's daughter is widowed or divorced and has no child and returns to her father's house, um, <clears throat> as in her youth, she may eat of her father's food, yet no lay person shall eat of it. Um, and if anyone eats of a holy thing unintentionally, there's restitution that needs to be made. Um, verse 15, they shall not profane the holy things of the people of Israel, which they contribute to the Lord. And so cause them to bear inequity and guilt by eating their holy things. For I am the Lord who mm. sanctifies them. So the one who eats is the one who bears, which is why only the priest can eat these things. But the priest can only bear because they have the right outfit. Yes. The lay people don't have that outfit, so they can't eat. Um, but the exception here, the reason I say this pictures the gospel is because if a priest bought a slave or, um, you know, or had someone born in their house, then that person had right to eat these holy things, even though a regular Israelite was cut off from eating these things. So in that way, in this one instance, a slave actually has more rights than the rights of any other citizen, which is like wild when you think about it like you, yeah. you go down to go up talk about dying to gain am i right um <laughs> and i would say that this applies to the christian we have double right to eat of holy things because our high priest jesus the messiah also bought us by his blood that fulfills one requirement bought by a priest so i have right to eat and also because by the spirit we're born again into the house of the son 
Therefore, by right of spiritual birth, we can eat. Therefore, eat freely of the food in the master's house as one with right of birth and right of a slave. I mean, like, come on. Like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's good. That's good. Yeah. And then you go even further, First Samuel, David, eating of the consecrated bread with his men, and Jesus using that as an example of like, look, what was more important? The people who need the bread of God, who mm -hmm. need salvation or following the rules. Right. Right. I mean, wild, absolutely wild. Um, but yeah, no, nah, like, again, just kind of feather in the cap that previous episode, um, slaves were not the scum of the earth. Yeah. In Israel. Like I said, e even but that, you know, um, I found that after the episode, funnily enough. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, nah, like, even there, like slaves get to eat holy food that regular Israelites don't eat. You can almost hear the, ah, you're telling me that him who was irresponsible with his money and had to sell himself into slavery, he gets to eat the priest food, but me responsible with my money, I don't get to eat. Um, yeah. You know, if you got a problem with it, build your own universe and write your own rules and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean we're having a party for my brother who came, who, who squandered his fortune in a foreign land and came back crawling on his hands and knees just for the scraps? What, what do you mean? I've been faithful this whole time, haven't I? Right, right, right. Like I said, you know, like grace is a better foundation for life than merit. But, you know, y'all y'all do what y'all want to do. <laughs> y'all do what y'all want to do. I, I am okay saying I am forgiven. Amen to that. I'm okay with so, that. So also here, we kind of see that, hey, just succeeding Aaron as high priest wasn't just getting a promotion the moment he died. Like there is a seven day ritual you have to prepare yourself for in order to actually prepare yourself for being the high priest to set yourself up for the task of leading an entire country as its spiritual leader. This was mm -hmm. done to prevent rushing into things and to hopefully make sure that the priest succeeding who came, the, the person who came before them was actually dutiful to their job, actually cared about what they were doing. You know, instead of uh, Ayara and uh, Annas and Caiaphas or just for political gain, being in charge of the people of Israel, not truly caring about mm -hmm. them and what they were supposed to be doing. And it's still very debatable whether they were of the line of Aaron. If there is a line there saying that, I'm sorry, I just didn't see it in this very massive Bible that has multiple <laughs> you know, books, chapters and verses. So I apologize if I got that wrong, but I believe they're not actually of the line of Aaron. So they already screwed at the beginning. and they screw themselves over by not actually caring about why they need to do what they do. Yep. Yep. And I'm like, man, like, you know, we gotta get right. We gotta get right. It's not enough to say yeah. that you're a uh, quote unquote qualified. If you don't have a heart for God or a heart for the people, you know, like, uh, I don't know, uh, go do something else. Go do something else. <laughs> You know, or yeah. better yet, um, you know, humble yourself before God, get that handled mm -hmm. and then let the spirit lead you, lead you as he will. Yeah. All right. Last part for this one for me. Um, the bull's death every day during this time <laughs> was meant to show that they had to keep sacrificing animals to God because one death is never going to be sufficient enough to even cover their sins. And no amount of killing animals ever would, yet this is still a great mercy, a great bit of grace extended their way that an animal has to die instead of me. And I know there's some animal lovers out there say, so God is just so cruel. Well, who made them? Who gets to make the rules? Oh, by the way, the person who made them. So yeah, I'm not happy a lot of animals have to die. That's kind of one of the minor points being made here is that something else has to suffer for your sake. Yeah. But you are so much worthier than this thing that is not sapient, that is not created in my image. 
that I'm willing to even overlook the fact that you are worth more inherently to have this cover you, even though you should be the one dying here. I mean, it's just like, you know, and the last time I was on with the uh, talking about social justice and all that, you know, we saw how seriously God takes death, you know, at at any level, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, so to see it here so strikingly. Um, I mean, when you think about it, in a, in a way, this is the most death that you see in Scripture since the garden. Like, like if you leave out the flood, if you leave out the flood, mm-hmm. this is the most death that you see in Scripture since, I mean, just, just since, you know? Um, you know so, so it's just so striking here just to show, like, no, this is the true damage of the fall. Like you've read it yeah. and you've seen it in Genesis and these other things, but you know, you only really get to know how broken something is once you start to try to fix it. All right. Like, and I've, you know, something I've said to, to patients before is like, Oh man, I didn't realize that my, that my heart failure is this bad. I didn't realize that my ejection fraction was so low. I didn't realize. Yeah, I know to you. They just felt like minor to moderate symptoms. But then when you actually come in, it's like, yeah, no, nah, like your heart's working at 10% capacity. I've actually had, I've actually had patients where it's like, you know, I asked the nurse, you know, how, you know, where, where's the heart function at? Oh, you know, it's working at 10% efficiency. And I'm like, oh, okay. All right. Well, at least we're not starting at zero. So let's, uh, let's see if we can move the ball forward. <laughs> see if we can move the ball forward today. Um, you know, I, I'll have patients that I look at their chest x-rays and, um, on a chest X-ray, in the lung spaces, you're supposed to see all black except for the ribs. The ribs should be white, but anything that's air should be black. You know, I'll have COVID patients or pneumonia patients where the entire lung field is whited out. Like it just Ugh. looks like someone took a took a white out thing and just all over the. You know, you can't even make out the rib distinctions. That's how white some of this stuff is. You know, and it's like. Yeah, you know, like you don't really get to know just how broken something is until you get your hands dirty and start trying to fix it one day at a time. In this case, one sacrifice at a time. Um, Mm. You know, they knew their sin was ugly before, but now that they actually have to start dealing with atonement. Ooh, I knew we were bad. I didn't realize we were this bad. I didn't realize we, we, we were bull every day for seven days bad. Yeah, that's a lot of bad. I didn't realize that we were, you know, you know, day of atonement every year bad. I didn't realize that we were, every, you know, blood offering for sin every time, every day. I, and I realized I was that bad off, Doc. I yeah. didn't realize that. And, and this is, depending on how you date the exes, this could be 1446 BC. This could be 12, you know, 17 or whatever BC. That is anywhere from 12 to 1400 straight years of doing this every single day. And even beyond that, to you know, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That's how many animals died in the place of the people of Israel over 1200, 1400 plus years. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, versus the man God himself coming down taking it all on himself and i have the ability to say yes to him uh which option am i going to take i'm going to take the the man god you know yeah yeah i'll take the i'll take the once for all time please it's like yeah the once for all time are you ready to fries please (laughs) you ready to finish this sucker off Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're going to love how this comes together. You're going to love how this comes together, my friend. (laughs) We've been building up to this moment. Be prepared for the next hour of power just on these last (laughs) verses. (laughs) 38 through 46. Now, this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs a year, uh, excuse me, two lambs a year old, day by day, regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And with the first lamb, a tenth measure of fine flour mingled with a fourth of a hen of beaten oil, and a fourth a hen of a hen of wine for a drink offering. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and you shall offer 
with it a grain offering and its drink offering, as in the morning, for a pleasing aroma of food offering to the Lord. It shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak you to you there. There I will meet with the people of Israel, and it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also in his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Ooh, man, one bull and two lambs. Two lambs a day. How about that? Um, like you were just saying, the bull sacrifice repeated over seven days purified the altar. Because again, everything's got to be purified with blood because it's all got a guilt. It's all got a curse attached to it. The lambs, morning and evening, food offerings and drink offerings for fellowship with God. This, I think, should give a whole new weight of significance to the idea that God's mercy is new every morning. Like twice a day, the priest is confronted with the blood of a lamb as he pursues fellowship and intimacy with God. Twice a day. So when Jesus comes on the scene, when John the Baptist comes on the scene, points to him and says, that's the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Like, like th- this is why I think that like the priests and the Pharisees had to know who Jesus was like, like stupid early on. <laughs> Because of stuff like this, like if you're going to say that, oh, I'm the lamb of God, like, well, you're given lambs morning and evening. Like, you know what the significance of the lamb is. You're saying that you are going to do for me what these morning and evening lamb sacrifices do for me, not just the one for the day of atonement. Because, you know, we didn't just have bulls and lambs and stuff for the day of atonement and the Passover and all that. You had lambs every day. You had to go through the blood of a lamb to achieve fellowship with God every day. And Jesus is saying, I'm him. That, that's me, right? In Revelation, we see a lamb as though slain, worthy to take the scroll. You know, this one that doesn't just pay for our sins, but is our daily, uh, is, is our daily stamp of approval into intimacy and fellowship with God. Amazing, amazing. And, and to your point about, you know, how long, did they do these things? Um, I had the same question actually, because it hit me. I was mm-hmm. like, that's a lot of lambs. I was like, I was like, I was like, no one, no wonder God told the people, if you're obedient to the law, I'll multiply the childbirth of your animals. Cause you're going to freaking need it. Um, you know, like you're going to need it, which I think is cool too. As you're obedient, God gives you more and more of what you need to continue in obedience that one's for free. I'll let y'all have that one. Um, but Luke chapter one, uh, verse starting in verse five, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division mm-hmm. of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Verse 8. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And they appeared to an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar. And we know the rest. But I'm focusing, as usual, on flyover territory. You're like, this isn't important. This is all setting up for the story. No, it's very important for our study here today. Luke 1, 5 to whatever I read, 9 or 10, shows that this command was remembered, even in Jesus' time, day after day, even under subjugation to Roman rule. They made sure to do this. That's how important this was. Um, And there were a lot of, there were a lot of, descendants of Aaron by that time, which is why they decided this by lot. And so, you know, there, there were so many, there were so many of them, but by that time that reasonably 
you could go through your whole life and only be called by random lot to do this like one time, maybe two um, in your life. And so this was a big deal, you know. You had people that would sacrifice the lamb and then you would come in with the incense and you'd have your prayer time or whatever. Um, and so I just think that's really cool because in Exodus, it says in verse 43, <coughs> there I will meet with the people of Israel. And in Luke, someone does it and God sends an angel to meet with his people. Like it's, it's literally what's described in Exodus. Um, so Luke's opening it is amazing and it is glorious, but to one that understands the law, it's like, oh, okay, like, like if an angel was going to show up and tell somebody something, it would be in this context. This makes mm. sense. Um, as stunning as that is, that's what makes it so interesting that Zechariah didn't listen. It's like you're doing all this because the law says that this is where God will meet his people. And I get that you're stunned that an angel showed up. And then you should be stunned by that, but you shouldn't like, this is within your grid. This is like the law told you that God meets with his people this way. You just have a particularly extraordinary meeting with the Lord <laughs> in this way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, I mean, it's just, just in incredible, you know, that he is sacrificing a lamb for communion with God, for fellowship with God. And then God sends an angel to tell him, hey, you're not going to have to give a lamb for too much longer because he's coming. And indeed, he's already here. Yeah. Like, whoa. <laughs> like, absolute, absolute wow. Absolute wow. Um, yeah. I'm really glad you brought got? that up because I, mean, I, I started with Luke 1 on this show and kept going from there. And yet that didn't really hit me until what you just said now. That makes a lot more sense of this ritual being done every single day. And then finally, God uses one of his own angels to appear before the people for the purposes of letting them know this is about to be abolished. This is about to be done. This is about it's to, about be, about to be fulfilled. <laughs> Y'all yeah. been making payments on your credit card for thousands of years. We're about to close that tab here real soon. Oof, there's going to be some student debt relief. Right, right. You know, and Zechariah wants to be all like, I don't understand how these things are going to be. Dude, it's what we've been building to for two to four thousand years. Like, can, can you can you just hush until all this is done? Like, I don't need your yapping right now, you know, but don't worry. Don't worry. The lamb is so glorious. So, you know, we'll, we'll pay for that, too. You'll <laughs> regain your ability to speak, you know. Like you just need to meditate on what's on what actually is possible for me. Everything, <laughs> everything, but especially the stuff I told you I was going to do, especially yeah. that stuff. Like, you can take that stuff to the bank. Um, yeah. I just think like, like, wow, 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 wow. Um, yeah. Now as pertains to beauty and glory. See, I didn't forget. No, you didn't. I didn't forget. Um, this is incredible. You know, now that we've had the full meditation on the outfit of the high priest and how important it is that he wears this when he does his duty, is it not intriguing that in Leviticus 16 and verse 23, it says, speaking of the day of atonement, then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall take off the linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. Another reason why I don't think the bells necessarily are the thing like, you know, because during the day of atonement, he's actually supposed to take it off. Like yes. on the day of atonement, the bells stop ringing for a time, you know? So like, you know, like the idea that he's got bells on when he's in there is like, no, the text says that it was the opposite. Actually, the bells would be sitting outside. But consider this, for a short time, for a short time during this rite, the high priest was not decked out in the beauty and glory of the outfit. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. During the time where the high priest is making atonement, he takes off his glory and sets it to the side. Hmm. So if you understand the outfit, what is he left in? 
He's simply clothed in all white, one fabric, a sinless man, not decked out in glory and honor, but a sinless man all the same by the language of the clothing. After his time in the tent of meeting, he puts that beautiful and glorious outfit on again. So before he makes atonement, he's decked out in beauty and glory. When he does his work to make atonement, he takes the glory and beauty off and sets it to the side. And when his work of atonement is done, he takes his beauty and glory up again. This, all of this, all of these little typologies, all these little pictures of Jesus that have been baked into this outfit are all there so that on the day of atonement, you get this picture, which is what it was all driving towards. It's a picture of Jesus in two ways. During the work of redemption, our high priest does two amazing things. One, as I've said already, he sets aside his beauty and glory and appears as just a sinless man. After the work of redemption is done, he takes his full beauty and glory up again. I think Jesus shows us this. I think that's part of the purpose of the Mount of Transfiguration is for us to see him decked out, I guess you might say, in full beauty and glory, just for a moment, so that we understand who he really is, right? During this short time of sojourning on earth, I'm just wearing all white. Nothing remarkable, except the fact that it's all white and it's one fabric. I'm not mixed like y'all, spiritually, but I'm not decked out in full transfiguration gear, right? Mm. And after the cross, Mm. when he ascends to the right hand, he takes up that beauty and glory again, right? That's why he says at the end of John to the Father, glorify me with the glory that I had before the world began. Amazing. Um, But the second thing that's amazing about this, what is attached to that outfit? The onyx stones and the ephod, the only two pieces Mm. that are bearing us with mixed fabric denoting our sins. So when he goes in, he, he's, he's going in to the Day of Atonement, right? Carrying his people with all their sins. And when he does that work of atonement, when he takes off his glory, he's also taking off our sin, right? So to take off our sin, he had to take off his glory. That's why he went through the shame of the cross because nothing less than that would actually deal with our sins, but he takes us off, right? He bears you and I into the place of sacrifice and atonement. And finally, after so long, sets our record of sins down. And after the work of redemption, he takes our names up again, carrying us with him forever. As Hebrews will put it, in, uh, in chapter 7, let me get there. Um, in chapter 7, verse 25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. After the work of redemption, he takes our names up again, carrying us with him forever. He always lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through him. Why? Because his, because our names are on him. Our names are on him. He goes in with us and he comes out with us. But while he's in there, he sets aside his glory so that he can set aside our sin and give us right to be called children of God. That right there, that, that is the full picture of the high priest garments. That is the way that the high priest outfit preached the gospel to the people of Israel every single year on the Day of Atonement, every single year, reminding them of the Passover, the blood that covered them and got them out of Egypt is the blood of the high priest who's going to carry you in, lay aside your record of sin, and bear you on him forever. Like, what more do you want? What? Right? <laughs> <clears throat> what but, more do you want? Yeah, you need the but, Ferrari too? Like he, he did it all. Like just pay attention to everything that is being done right here. That's what all these rules and statutes and rituals and ceremonies and sacrifices, 
What are they for? Not because the priest has nothing better to do. Not because, you know, you didn't have television back in the day, so you had to entertain yourself somehow. It's like, this is for your sake. Done so that you don't get what you rightfully deserve. Mm -hmm. So that the priest doesn't get what he rightfully deserves. This is done in such a loving, holy manner that we simply don't deserve. And yet it was offered freely. And he brings it up right now before he brings up tons of other things. Yeah, Loving your neighbor as yourself, great part of Leviticus. That's the reason people quote it all the time. There's a reason Jesus quotes it. But... Before you can even grasp that part, you need to understand you yourself are not right with me. So let's do that first. Then I'm going to teach you a little more about what we started with, like the Ten Commandments and everything. Like this, this is a little preview of things to come. They tell you, oh, those things you think you weren't doing so badly. Uh, well, I, I might have told a lie, but oh, God didn't say anything about it. Oh, God says something about it. Oh, I, I've coveted my neighbor's ox or, or his wife or something like that. And you're thinking about that in mind of what he is saying right here, and you're actually paying attention. You go, okay, I'm not good enough. And this is the only way that I am aware of as a 15th, 13th century Jew at this point in time of making things right. Well, maybe I should be grateful for that. But in you know three chapters, we're going to be worshiping some golden calf. But you know, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like <laughs> you got it all laid out on a platter, and and you chose you chose a gold cow, bro. Like <clears throat> tough, absolutely tough. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's I mean, come on, come on, Christian. Like that's that's good. That's good. That's good stuff, man. I I, I told you it would all tie together. I, I told you. No, that was beautifully and wonderfully said. Just uh, tying everything together in a way that I never would have dreamed to do so. And I, you know what? I may have said it like 50 times before. This is why I enjoy working with you. <laughs> I, think, I, I think we bring out the best in each other. That we do. That we certainly do. Oh, man. Yeah, y'all are, are lucky to have this guy. Really lucky to have this guy, man. Oh, man. Hey. You know? Uh, it's we just, gotta look it, out for each other, man. It's it's just it's it's just wild to me. Again, like you see what I mean? Like I, I hope, you know, listener, listener, I hope that I've definitely proven my case. Or at the very least, because I know some people are just hard to heart, um, you know, earn the benefit of the doubt when I say, no, nah, that the Bible is um it, it's deeper than you know and better than you realize. Mm. You know, like all this came from an outfit. This came from an outfit that a lot of people probably don't even read about. What's all that? Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand what my Old Testament has to do with me. We're not under the law. Yeah. None of what we talked about for the last two hours had to do with any Christian being under the law. But it did have to do with the law being a schoolmaster that leads you to Christ. Yes. And actually, the word in the Greek isn't even schoolmaster. It's tutor. And I like tutor a little bit better because what kind of students get tutors? The ones that understand everything or the ones that have trouble understanding anything? Yes. The second one. Right. I so need help. like, so like, you know, I need God, help. right. Like God knew, you know, I've been, you know, praise God. I've been discipling my little brother, um, you know, he just recently uh, seems to have come to the faith like you know, the other week or so. Um, Excellent. Yeah. That's yeah. Good news. Um, right. 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 Um, but one of his, one of the things that kind of gatekeeps him, and I think it's one of the, those things that gatekeeps all of us is this really forgiveness. Like I don't have to do anything to add to this. Like, like he paid for it all. Like I can right now say that I'm a Christian. I'm like, yeah, you can, if you want, if you really Game feel, if you really feel that that's true. And I know him well enough to know that I, I think that in his mind, he does think that, but he doesn't want to say it because he doesn't feel like he's earned it. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, you haven't. That's the point. You know, actually, last time he was over at my place, I gave him one of my Bibles. Um, and he was like, 
He was like, I, I can't take this, man. I was like, no, you can take it. And he was like, well, I'll get it back to you once, you know. I was like, let me let me guess. You, you want to get this back to me once you've bought your own. And he's like, yeah, yeah, how, how, how'd you know? And I'm like, one, you're my brother. But two, at a deeper level, um, you don't want this to be a gift. Like, you like the idea of God wanting to get to know you, but out of your own right understanding of the weight of your own sin, there's a desire to want to do something to make that right. And I'm telling you, God's already done it all. You just have to rest in that, which is why I'm gifting you a Bible. I don't want it back because even if you do buy your own, I want you to look at this particular one and understand that just like you didn't buy that, you didn't buy him, Mm. you know? And so God sets up this elaborate scheme with the people of Israel and he embeds all these little pictures of Jesus into everything that they do so that us today would read this and be instructed in it and that the law that we are not under would function as a tutor to our hard headedness, that this really is about grace. Go back and read the law. See how grace was embedded in everything because just Jesus telling you one time is not going to be enough uh, to hold a lot of us. You're going to need to see picture after picture after picture of, no, it really is by grace. It really is by grace. It's really always been by grace. And with those repeated affirmations, you should gain the ability to be able to have the faith to say, ah, it's finished. It's really finished. You know, then mm. these pictures should help remind you of the theology you've already been taught. Um, my last piece, and then you can do what you want to kind of wrap things up. But one, yeah. the one safeguard, the one safeguard about typology is this typology does not create theology. Typology reveals theology that you've already been taught. Hmm. Right. That's that's where Catholics and all sorts of other people go wrong with typology. They try to use pictures to write doctrine. No, 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 no. Pictures clarify doctrine. That's what Jesus meant when he said Moses wrote about him. And that's why I love to do it. I learn more about Jesus every time. Amen to that. I've got two things because we already covered one of the other ones I had. But uh, real quick, uh, the drink offering, that's something that will be expounded more on Leviticus, like many great things that are here. But it was simply meant as another gift to God. The total pouring out of the wine before God was meant to show that the person who was offering it was now emptying themselves completely before him as kind of a the physical way of showing an inward change that could – under the right, uh, the wrong person be done incorrectly. But if the priest was doing their job, it would show the the change in their heart, the, what they actually wanted to be done, removing the sin from themselves. And then the last thing I have is that, yeah, like we talked before, these sacrifices are meant to be daily rituals, but they weren't to be done as a chore or in a disrespectful manner. They were meant for the priests to commune with God daily and spend time with him in reflecting over their lives and the lives of the people they serve. That is why it's explicit. Like do these things, do it this way. Do not do it any other way because if it's done in another fashion, it's not being done correctly. If it's being done with a a spirit of, well, now it's time to go kill that lamb again. I got that to look forward to. I got to do it tonight too. Yeah. Sorry, little lammy. And then you know, slice the throat, you know, I'll put it on my ear, blah, 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 whatever. <laughs> that it, You're missing the point of what's happening there. And, and that's that applies to any job in general. I mean, that it definitely applies to ministry. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, great. I got to preach before the church today. Oh, great. I've got to go meet someone in the hospital today because they need their pastor there. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> They need you there because you have been gifted with something amazing. And regardless of what that what that is, it doesn't have to be the pastor who visits someone in a hospital or who is helping out in a homeless ministry or what have you. 
but it has to be a person who is doing it willingly and lovingly. And if you fail to do that, you might as well not even show up that day. Mm -hmm. Facts. And and we're going to see in Leviticus two people who just showed up that day that are of the line of Aaron that don't quite make the cut. Oh, man. Oh, man. That's... You might call that a uh, a strange occurrence. <laughs> but yeah, that's all I got to say about that. Oh, man. It was fun. Yeah. Would you go ahead and plug yourself again for the good people? Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, man. If, uh, you know, if you've made it this far, um, I think that means you might like my content as well. Um, <laughs> the Foreign Saints. On Spotify and YouTube, you get the audio with the visual, get to see my face, get to see the screen share. If you're just an audio only person, check out Apple or any other place you can get your podcasts. Um, Like I said, I'm going through a series uh, verse by verse on Matthew right now. Um, I've got a video on prophecy um, and how to rightly handle that, uh, that I'm beginning uh, as a plan for. That should show up on YouTube exclusively. Um, and I've also got a series on transgenderism and the gospel to be coming down the line here real soon, again, on YouTube, probably YouTube exclusively as well. Um, so yeah, give me a, you know, give me a listen, give me a follow pretty please. Um, be sure, share his content as well. Um, and while you're doing all of that, be sure that you personally are pushing into the Lord, pursuing him pursuing righteousness, pursuing holiness, pursuing ways that you too can be a part of what the spirit is doing in the world. Um, you know, drawing men unto the sun. Um, it's fun. It's awesome. It's tough and it's shorthanded. So, uh, you know, (laughs) petition the father, see what the father's got that you can be a part of today. Oh yeah. Yeah. Speaking of your stuff, I think I figured out what I wanted to do. I meant to text you earlier, hmm. but um, spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. And like the Christian response to believing in the supernatural. Nice. Okay. I know this is a very right. broad. We can take that however you want to go. That I'm we can. You. That we can. Well, like I said, fun. I got some books in the armory behind me that uh, will be helpful for that. And, and there you go. More content. I will soon be having Christian Ashley uh, guest starring on The Foreign Saints talking about spiritual warfare. You heard it here first. People. Yeah. Be there. Be square. It's going to be a great conversation. <laughs> Guys, thank you for sticking out again with us. Hey, it's another two hour long episode. The third time in a row that happens. You know, I'm beginning to think this might not be coincidence <laughs> that Karai and I like talking. <laughs> oh, man, man. Great, man. It's and, great stuff. Yeah. Oh, such an absolute blast. Thanks for coming along with me on this one. Guys, if you get a chance, please just leave a five star review in your podcasting platform of choice. Help us with the ratings data. Find more people. Uh, did we blow your mind today about two chapters that you really didn't look over? Well, uh, join the club because I'm amongst you. And there's more There's more to be learned from reading through these scriptures. So please let more people know about the show. Share it. Uh, if you get a chance as well, if you were interested in my own works, you can find my stuff at right, starvingwritersguild.com or on Amazon by searching the name MC Ashley. If you're all interested in some further solid studies into the Bible and its teachings, then check out the other members of the Anatel Ministries Podcasting Network. You can contact me at letnothingmoveyoupodcast at gmail.com. I'd like to extend a special thank you to Joshua Knoll for the editing that he does and for the music he has to the podcast. And with all that in mind, God bless you on accordance to his will and not mine. And allow me one more time to remind you, let nothing move you. Hey guys, are you interested in podcasting but don't know where to go? Well, check out Zencaster.com and go ahead and make an account there and use special promo code Let Nothing Move You, all caps. That way you can get 30% off of your next deal to go ahead and set things up so you can figure out how to edit stuff using Zencaster.com to host your stuff to get things done there. So check out Zencaster.com, use special promo code Let Nothing Move You. All right, see ya.